evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here at First Christian Reformed Church. Thank you, Phil, for hosting this, and uh, you're a brave man on this topic, and so we appreciate that very much. Um, it's hard for me to believe that it's, I'm in my eighth year in holding this chair. I came in the summer of 1999, and Michael Duggan and I were just chatting. He began at St. Mary's one year earlier in 1998. On the other hand, I think David Bereshit and Ann Moore go way back at the University of Calgary, uh, certainly longer than I do. Um, the Chair of Christian Thought has a vision, and I think this evening is that vision, that we somehow connect uh, the academic study of religion with uh, people of faith, people of curiosity, like yourselves. And I can't tell you how exciting it is for me to, to be able to give a platform to people like this and to see an audience such as you are this evening. Um, this kind of exchange doesn't happen all that often. We as professors, you've heard of the proverbial ivory tower, and there's some truth to that. We talk a lot to each other, we talk to our students, but we don't always get the message out beyond the four walls of the university. So I think it's important that this happens, and I'm gratified that you think that this kind of thing is worthwhile as well. You demonstrate that by your attendance. We do try to advertise these events as widely as we can, and we have a mailing list now of about a thousand names. That includes churches. And if an important person like yourself is not on our mailing list, feel free to sign this sheet uh, later on during the refreshment time, and we'll add you to our list. Um, we won't put you on other mailing lists or anything like that. It's just to let you know about lectures that the university is sponsoring. Um, there are some upcoming lectures I want to bring to your attention. We have a lecture coming up at the end of October. October the 30th, it's also a Monday. Um, Dr. Crawford Gribben is coming from the UK, and he's going to talk about left behind fiction and the evangelical crisis. What these books, the Left Behind series, maybe you've seen the movie, um, what these tell us about the state of Christianity in the United States today. And as we usually do, we have an on-campus lecture the following day. There he'll talk about the USA in rapture fiction. He is professor of English and American studies at the University of Manchester in the UK. We have upcoming lectures in January and March as well, and we'll tell you more about those as, as the time gets a, a little bit a little bit closer. This lecture this evening is in honor of Canon Archdeacon uh, Cecil Swanson, who died in 1984. Uh, the Chair of Christian Thought is a, truly a community enterprise. It was, it was concerned Christians and churches in Calgary that created this chair. And uh, those that included Anglicans and Presbyterians and Lutherans and Baptists and Roman Catholics and Anglicans and many other individuals as well. And the lectures are named for some of these uh, early um, supporters of the chair, including Cecil Swanson. And uh, he spent time as the dean of the cathedral that was at that time at Christ Church here in Calgary, back in uh, the 1950s, actually, and 40s, going way back. So that's where the, where the name Swanson Lectures uh, comes from, because of Cecil Swanson. This evening it's going to go like this. We're going to give each of our presenters about uh, 20 minutes uh, to do their thing and then to engage with each other a little bit. Um, you've heard what they say about professors, where you have two professors in a room, you have at least three or four opinions. And I'm sure that's true this evening with our presenters. We'll give them a chance to engage a bit with each other, um, all in good fun and hopefully on a high level. Anne? Um, <laughs> Anne's my neighbor at the University of Calgary, and we kind of dish it out to each other now and then. Um, and then we'll have open discussion. We did promise, we have, this is a traveling mic in my hand, and we'll give you a chance to uh, ask your questions. Please keep them fairly concise. Uh, if you have a point to make, make it brief, and hopefully you have a question to ask, because um, that's the idea, that you, you engage the panelists and let them make their points. Uh, the Da Vinci Code, the movie, the book. How many have either seen the movie or read the book? Okay, that's virtually everybody. And I'm not surprised. Um, it's, it's, it's a phenomenon in our culture. How many, how many weeks was it on the bestseller list? Uh, well over 100, maybe 150, I, at least 100. 
um, long time, like two years, I think. Somebody has said in terms of its literary quality, it's badly written and error-strewn. Uh, and that was one of the admirers of the book. No, just, just kidding. Um, why is it such a phenomenon in our culture? Anne Moore is going to address this question. Uh, I think the book itself, not to steal Anne's thunder, but I think the book itself in one spot actually gives us a hint. And it goes like this, everyone loves a conspiracy. The book is provocative. It says things like this, almost everything our fathers taught us about Jesus Christ is false. Jesus intended the future of his church to be in the hands of Mary Magdalene, not Peter. So, uh, I mean, that's, that's enough to get up anybody's curiosity. Is there any evidence for such claims? Uh, so I'm just setting the stage here. Uh, we have three very fine panelists to help us navigate these kinds of questions. Uh, Dr. David Bearshed received his PhD from the University of California, and uh, he has taught at various universities, including UCLA, Arizona State, University of Calgary, and St. Mary's College, it's a University College in South Calgary. He has won 12 teaching awards at the U of C. Uh, he's a devoted professor. Just so you know, he actually bypassed my dinner invitation tonight so he could be here in advance just to make sure everything was clicking along smoothly. Um, if that's what it requires to get a teaching award, I, I don't think I'll ever make it. Um, I'm the one who kind of runs in two minutes late, and uh, anyway, we won't, we won't go there. He is one of the world's authorities on 17th century Italian art. And if you know anything about the Da Vinci Code, which you do, uh, that's quite relevant to what we're discussing tonight. And Leonardo da Vinci and some earlier artists, um, late Renaissance, early modern art is his field. He has published a book called The Christian Traveler's Guide to Italy, which has uh, some best-selling numbers in its sales. Michael Duggan is a native Calgarian, attended St. Mary's High School, and has a degree from the University of Saskatchewan in philosophy, and he studied at the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome, the Pontifical Biblical Institute in Rome. So you can see what he is bringing to our discussion tonight. His PhD is from the Catholic University in Washington, DC. He's an associate professor of religious studies and theology at St. Mary's College here in Calgary. Uh, he's not just an academic uh, in terms of his investment of time because he's busy in social justice issues and active in interfaith dialogue. And last but not least, my colleague Ann Moore has her PhD in Christian origins from Claremont Graduate School. And uh, so she brings an expertise that again is relevant to our subject this evening, Christian origins. She also teaches in areas of religion and film, uh, women and religion, and she is certainly one of the most popular teachers in our Department of Religious Studies at the University of Calgary. So uh, I will start with Anne Moore. And then we'll go to David and we'll let Michael wrap up. Okay. I'm Mike. So I'm okay. Now, David, you said I was to go for 80 minutes, right? Minimum. Minimum, okay, okay. I'm kidding, all right. As Doug was saying, one of the things I'm going to take a look at is why I think the Da Vinci Code has remained so popular. As Doug was suggesting, the book, as of May 2006, had sold more than 60.5 million copies, making it one of the top 10 bestsellers of, old time, of all time. And it's been translated into 44 languages. Its success has been the subject of countless articles in almost every major newspaper and magazine, and it has spawned a host of TV documentaries and books that investigate its various theories. In fact, there now seems to be a whole publication industry associated with the Da Vinci Code that is either concerned with rebutting its ideas or exploiting its success through other fictional compositions that incorporate similar themes. I've noticed that chapters now can dedicate three bookshelves to everything to do with the Da Vinci Code. 
There are tourist packages to France and England that use the Da Vinci Code as foundation for the various locations for sightseeing. And of course, there's the 2006 movie directed by Ron Howard, which had the second largest opening gross in movie history, and probably even more protests than Martin Scorsese's The Last Temptation of Christ. So, this is the aspect of the Da Vinci Code I wish to explore. Why is the Da Vinci Code so successful? Why did more Harvard alumni attend Harriet Attridge's speak on the Da Vinci Code than the speech given by the new president of the Harvard University? Why do people find its fiction so compelling that they wish to investigate its possibilities? The Da Vinci Code captured people's imagination because it incorporated a collection of suppositions that were already part of our popular culture. These collections of suppositions may be categorized into four areas, areas of convergence. Number one, lost scrolls and conspiracy theories, women's involvement in early Christian heresies, the suppression of women and or the divine female principle by patriarchal religious institutions, and finally, night mythology and the Templars. Given the context of this lecture and out of time considerations, I'm going to discuss the first three clusters of suppositions. So let me begin with the first one. Lost scrolls and conspiracy theories. In 1945, a group of Egyptian villagers digging for a form of fertilizer along the banks of the Nile discovered a large pottery jar. Upon opening the jar, they discovered a collection of ancient books or codices. These are now the famous Gnostic Gospels or Nag Hammadi Library. These codices, written in the Egyptian language of Coptic, represent a collection of literature associated with an early Christian group known as the Gnostics. Yes, Dan Brown is incorrect on two points here. He refers to the Gnostic Gospels as scrolls. He's wrong, there are books. And second, he identifies their language as Aramaic. Again, he's wrong, it was Coptic. The Gnostics believed Jesus was a supernatural being who had possessed a human body for the purposes of communicating a special message to humanity. This message stated that humans were a dualistic entity comprised of a body from the material world and a divine spark from the true God of light. The goal of humanity was to seek liberation from the material prison of body and earth in order to return to the divine light. One of the interesting features of these texts was the presence of Mary Magdalene as an authoritative teacher. She is found in this role in the Gospel of Philip and the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. This discovery, though, did not capture popular cultural interest at this moment in time, i.e. 1945. The texts, after all, were associated with a heretical Christian group, the Gnostics, who were already known to scholars through other sources. And while there was some newspaper coverage about the intrigue in reference to the recovery of the text, about the black market antiquity dealers that were involved, about the theft of one of the codexes, and some interest later on about the delay in the publication of the text due to the monopolistic behavior on the part of the European scholars, the impact of the Gnostic Gospels was minimum within popular culture. However, they did contribute the notion of lost scrolls and the idea that lost scrolls could or did challenge previous views of Christian history. In terms of lost scrolls and conspiracy theories, it was the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls that had the major impact within popular culture. 
The Dead Sea Scrolls are a collection of approximately 825 to 870 documents, including texts from the Hebrew Bible that were found in various caves near the Dead Sea between the years of 1947 and 1956. These scrolls date between the second century BC and the first century AD. Written mostly in Hebrew, there are some texts in Aramaic and a few in Koine Greek. Yes, this is where Dan Brown got his ideas about scrolls written in Aramaic. This is what's there. Since the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, there have been numerous theories expressed in scholarly articles and books, newspaper and magazine articles, fictional novels, TV documentaries and movies, and even supermarket tabloids that connect the Dead Sea Scrolls with the historical Jesus and early Christianity. Some of these theories have suggested that John the Baptist and or Jesus were members of the community who wrote the scrolls. One scholar, Barbara Thuring, an Australian scholar whose research is the Dead Sea Scrolls, has proposed that the scrolls reveal that Jesus married, divorced, remarried, and was a father of four and that the canonical gospels were manufactured myths designed to hide these facts and present an alternative truth. The scrolls also indicate that the true knowledge about what Jesus did was reserved for an elite group of Gnostics. Her work, widely rejected in the scholarly community, was showcased in a TV documentary in 1990. And her book, Jesus and the Riddle of the Dead Sea Scrolls, did receive vast publication and a certain readership. It has even been translated into seven different languages. Recently, Robert Iserman, professor of Middle Eastern religions and archeology span at California State University, Long Beach, has theorized that some of the scrolls refer to an early Christian community, which was more fundamentalist and rigid than the communities associated with the New Testament Gospels. He even suggested that some of the texts were related to James, Jesus' brother, and the Apostle Paul. The scholarly community does not accept any of his theories either. The Dead Sea Scrolls do provide information about formative Judaism, which in turn provide necessary information for understanding the historical context for the historical Jesus. But we don't believe there's any Jesus in the Dead Sea Scrolls. However, the point is that for several decades, people have heard in some form or fashion about a collection of lost scrolls that reveal an alternative history or perspective on the historical Jesus and Christianity. It is an idea that is now contained within our popular culture. Therefore, when Dan Brown incorporates this idea into his novel, it has the ring of truth because we are familiar with it. We've heard it before, even if we don't like to admit that we've looked at the subway market tabloids. Okay. The other popular culture aspect of the Dead Sea Scrolls is related to the delay in their publication. The major focus was on material from Cave 4, which represented about 40% of the documents. The material had been assigned to an international team of scholars led by Father DeVoe, who was more concerned with the archaeology of the site and writing about his theories on the community associated with the scrolls than translating the documents. After his death in 1971, his team members refused to grant access to other scholars, and the texts were delayed further. Finally, in 1988 and 1999, 
two publications appeared produced by outsiders who broke the monopoly. In particular, the edition produced by Robert Eiserman and James N. Robinson created a major media sensation because it reproduced actual photographs of K-4 documents. This delay in publication stimulated a number of conspiracy theories. Most of the theories suggested that the K-4 scrolls were not being published because they contained information damaging to the Christian church's version of Jesus and or Christian history. In particular, Michael Bejan and Richard Lee in their book, The Dead Sea Scrolls Deception, suggested that the Vatican was the major force behind the suppression of the scrolls. They were not the only ones to make this suggestion. Let me indicate, there was no conspiracy on the part of the Vatican or the Christian church. The only conspiracy was by a group of scholars who did not want to release their control over the scrolls. However, in our popular culture, there were these ideas about a conspiracy led by the Christian church to suppress ancient documents because they challenged the orthodox presentation of Jesus. Again, when Dan Brown incorporated these ideas into his book, they have the ring of truth because we've seen them on TV, heard them on the news, seen them on the bookshelves, and glanced at them at the supermarket in the tabloids. Women and Christian heresies. The discovery of the Gnostic Gospels may not have been a major contributor to the popular cultural view of lost scrolls and conspiracy theories. However, they were a contributing force in the popular cultural view of the suppression of women and Mary Magdalene by Orthodox Christianity. I'm going to do this. How many people have read Elaine Pagel's work or work by Elaine Pagels? Okay, she's falling, falling out of favor, I see. At one point in time, you would have asked that question and almost 90% of the room would have raised their hands. For many people, their first introduction to the Gnostic Gospels was through the work of Princeton University professor Elaine Pagels. At Harvard University, she was part of a team studying the Gnostic Gospel manuscripts. Based upon this study, she wrote a popular introduction to the material known as the Gnostic Gospels. It was published in 1979 and has never been out of print. The book itself was a bestseller and won the National Book Critics Circle Award, the National Book Award, and it was selected by the Modern Library as one of the 100 best books of the 20th century. In the Gnostic Gospels, Pagels proposed that Gnosticism was a form of Christianity especially attractive to women because it had an egalitarian perspective that allowed women into leadership roles, and this was evident in the female participation in various sacred rites. Further, she proposed that one of the reasons the Orthodox Church declared Gnosticism heresy was because their egalitarian view of woman, women was in conflict with the view of women held by the Orthodox Church, that view being women are inferior and subordinate. This conflict was emphasized in Pagel's book, Adam, Eve, and the Serpent, written in 1982. Let me say that the issue of women in early Christianity is highly complex, and it's still in a discovery process. There is new information emerging every year. So speaking from a position that may be subject to change, let me say that one thing 
we do agree upon is that Pagel's estimation of Gnosticism and its conflict with Orthodox Christianity over women is not what we believe to be true anymore. The prominence of Mary Magdalene in some of the Gnostic texts, such as the Gospel of Philip and the Gospel of Mary, and her portrait as the disciple who understands Jesus' Gnostic teachings do hint at a positive view for women. However, the Gnostic texts routinely suggest that the female must become male in order to gain admittance into the realm of light. Furthermore, the suppression of women by, quote, the Orthodox Church is overstated to say the least. The ancient world is the ancient world and it is not overly feministic. However, women did have certain leadership roles in, quote, the Orthodox Church. We do see women as presbyters, deacons, patrons, and writers. The Orthodox Church did acknowledge the pivotal role of Mary Magdalene, as can be noted in Hippolytus's title for her, Apostle of the Apostles. However, the familiarity of Pagel's writings, which suggests that within our popular culture, the idea that the Orthodox Church suppressed women is something that people would be familiar with. Pagel's view is reinforced by certain theories expressed within the early writings of feminist theology. And I'd like to introduce a caveat so I can make it out of the hall alive, okay? I honor and I respect the early feminists. I applaud the work that was so necessary. And in fact, what they did provided a climax that enabled me to take the type of career I have. However, we women historians now find ourselves in an uncomfortable situation because we must challenge some of their original work. And that's because we have now been looking at the text and discovering new sources. We are discovering that in some cases, the issue may not have been the intentional suppression of women, but the lack of information about women because contemporary male scholars had not studied the sources with women as a focus or a point of research. However, some early feminist writings, such as Mary Daly's Beyond God the Father or her book The Metaethics of Radical Feminism, suggest that either Judaism and Christianity were inherently patriarchal or the orthodox version of the religion was patriarchal and women were forced to find religious expression in heresies. This has remained a constant theme. It is seen in a 1992 article by Ross Shepard Kramer entitled literally, Heresy as Women's Religion and Women's Religion as Heresy. This theory of orthodox suppression of women does have a variant. Elizabeth Schuller Frenza and other feminist theologians have suggested that the original Jesus movement was egalitarian. And often in these discussions, the figure of Mary Magdalene has a prominent role. The simplified version of his theory is that Jesus and his early movement were egalitarian, and they welcomed women into the movement on an equal level with the men. However, this initial egalitarian society was lost once Christianity became part of the larger Roman society. Again, the new generation of women historians are finding that the presence and role of women within the Jesus movement and early Christianity is much more complex. And this early feminist theory, due to its simplification, distorts the reality of history. My point, though, is along with the books of Elaine Pagos, 
there were numerous writings associated with feminist writers and theologians that were read by millions of women, and occasionally maybe the husbands got hold of them. Their writings reinforced the idea that the Orthodox Church behaved in patriarchal ways that resulted in the suppression of women or their marginalization. Again, the point being is once that idea is introduced in Dan Brown's book, it has the ring of truth because we are familiar with it. Suppression of women by institutional religion. There is another aspect of the discussion of women and religion that also has had an impact on the Da Vinci Code phenomenon. Concurrent with the rise of feminism in North America in the 1970s, there was a realization that many Western religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, the women were not treated in equal terms and that masculine gender and imagery were predominantly attached to the term God. This observation produced a series of questions about whether the treatment of, a, of women within a religion was associated with the gender representation of the deity and whether women could find appropriate expression of the religiosity with a male deity. The answer for some women was the goddess movement, which focused on the female expression of the sacred. This movement spread rather rapidly within Western culture. Two journals dedicated to the movement, Woman's Spirit and Beltine Papers, started in 1974. They're still in publication. Starhawk published The Spiral Dance in 1979, which has remained in print since that time, and it has literally become the sacred scripture for the goddess movement. There were books by Z. Budapest, Carol Christ, and Naomi Goldberg that contributed to the movement. The movement also adopted the theory of Marja Jimbutas. Jimbutas, an archaeology, published three books. The Goddess and the Gods of Old Europe, 1974, The Language of the Goddess in 1989, and The Civilization of the Goddess in 1991. In these books, she proposed the existence of a Bronze Age, goddess-centered, matriarchal, peaceful culture that was replaced by Indo-European, patriarchal, androcentric warrior culture. Her theory attracted the attention of Joseph Campbell, the great scholar of myths, and many Jungian psychologists, and it was adopted by many in the goddess movement. Her theory did not gain acceptance within the scholarly community, which applauded her knowledge but certainly challenged her critical analysis. However, as with all the previous discussion, it is not the reception of her theory by scholars that is the major issue. Her theory, along with the goddess movement, produced scores of books, a National Film Board trilogy entitled Women and Spirituality, popular magazine journals, and various groups that discuss the function and role of the goddess or the sacred feminine for women's spirituality. Her theory was incorporated into a book entitled The Chalice and the Blade, which is referenced very directly in the film, and its ideas helped to create a more recent collection of books by Margaret Starberg called The Women with the Alabaster Jar, 1993, and The Goddess in the Gospels, 1998, that present Mary Magdalene in the position of a goddess figure. These books are included on Dan Brown's website as suggested reading. Again, my suggestion is Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code has a ring of truth because it captured some of the ideas found in connection with the goddess movement and they were already popular in our culture. 
The success of the Da Vinci Code rests in part on its ability to capture several clusters of suppositions found in our popular culture. It gives the impression or ring of truth because we are familiar with many of its ideas or concepts from various sources. The book and the movie are vivid reminders that the discussion of religious issues is not limited to the churches, mosques, temples, or the halls of the academy. The discussion is part of the ongoing Tower of Babel that's associated with popular culture. And it raises an issue about how the academy and religious institutions should engage with this popular culture. Some of the theories present in popular culture represent bad, outdated, or sensationalized scholarship. The rebuttals of these positions, though, are often not done in popular style that captures the interest of book publishers or audiences. The various books on decoding or cracking the Da Vinci Code remain biased in their presentation in order to sell their book, or they simply become a list of corrections. The books do not address some of the burning issues. Those issues include, what do we really know about the early history of Christianity? What do we really know about the role of women within the early church. It is interesting that Ron Howard, the director of the film, made history one of the dominant themes of the film. It is Robert Langdon's personal history as a young child trapped in a well that produces his adult fear of closed spaces. It is Sophie's history as a descendant of the line of Jesus and Mary that resulted in the loss of her parents and placed her in danger. In other words, one cannot escape one's history. One must encounter it and come to terms with it. It is the goal of Sir Tebing and the bishop to reveal or preserve respective histories of the church. Sir Teban and the bishop are presented as fanatics in their overwhelming concern to present, maintain, and control the presentation of history. The film, then, on one level, is a challenge to reveal, know, and understand the various stories or histories in a way that does not result in fanaticism which desires to maintain one version of the story against all others. History is complex and diverse and is in a constant state of revision as one discovers new information or gathers new insights. Even the history of Christianity is part of this revisionary process. I would suggest that the movie and the book are a challenge to engage in a critical examination of this history as part of an educated dialogue in which the diversity and the variety of early Christian history is discussed. And we should not get led astray in simply engaging the book or the film in a tit for tat about factual fallacies or corrections. Well, I hope all of you can hear me and that the, uh, in the back row everything is clear. I'm an art historian and we look at things very differently, I'm happy to say, to the theologians because we can avoid all the serious uh, complications uh, involving Christ's divinity or whether it's Mary Magdalene or whether it's John the Evangelist and Da Vinci's Last Supper. And what I hope to do tonight is to show you visually what exactly an art historian does 
and to rebut, I hope to rebut, almost all, if, if not all, of uh, Dan Brown's assertions in the Da Vinci Code on the Last Supper. In fact, there is not one shred of truth in anything he asserts, but I don't want to be aggressively against Dan Brown. <laughs> His book sold how many millions? 20? My Christian Traveler's Guide, which unfortunately is not on sale as you leave. <laughs> was not quite as popular, but I'm sure they're going to do a movie of it, and I know Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt is definitely going to play me. <laughs> We're going to give him 600 more pounds, but nevertheless, uh, it will occur. So let's take a look at the history of art, and the history of art really is the translation of ideas into visual form, and that's exactly what I hope to show you by giving you examples of other Last Suppers, certainly what Leonardo himself would have seen, and try to put it in the context of why Leonardo's work is so great, why it is so distinguished, and what contribution it in fact makes not only to the history of art, but to the history of ideas. So if we can get all the lights off, we'll start by taking a look uh, we can turn them all down. Hopefully there'll be people here when the lights go back up. I'm always worried about that. <laughs> be completely isolated. <laughs> you three are staying here no matter what. I can see the three of you. <laughs> at any rate, what we see is at least the only known portrait of Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, executed by him, it's a self-portrait. Probably dates about 1517, two years before his death in 1519. And as we begin to examine Leonardo, just some brief biography might be uh, worthwhile. He was born in the year 1452 in the town of Vinci, hence his name, Leonardo from Vinci. He was the illegitimate son of a servant in the employ of a lawyer. And shortly after his birth, his mother left him and he was raised by the lawyer who, in the year 1466, brings Leonardo to the city of Florence, the cradle of the Renaissance, and there uh, has him apprenticed to the studio of Andrea del Verrocchio, one of the most significant artists of the late 15th century in Florence. He spends six years in the workshop of Verrocchio. 1472, he establishes himself as an independent artist, and he remains another decade in Florence until he decides to leave the city and seek employment in the city of Milan with the Duke of Milan, Lodovico Sforza. Now his trip from Florence to Milan really marks a turning point in his life because literally and figuratively, he's turning his back on the golden age of the Renaissance. And he goes to a city, Milan, where mathematics and mechanics are more assiduously studied. And it's in the climate of Milan, of course, the intellectual and the political and the economic, that Leonardo executes his first great painting. And that, of course, is the subject of tonight's lecture, The Last Supper. Now, as we take a look at the painting itself, I should show you what it looked like after an Allied bombing raid in the year 1943. As you take a look at the upper portion of the slide, that's the dining room, the refectory of the Dominican uh, monastery, which adjoined the church of Santa Maria della Grazie. A bombing raid went awry, and the load uh, was dropped, and as you can see, the entire dining uh, complex was ruined, except for one wall, and by the grace of God, what survived was Leonardo's Last Supper. So as we take a look at the scene, we should think uh, in terms of how lucky we are that it hasn't met in a complete and total obliteration. But it's not the worst catastrophe, in fact, that has happened to the Last Supper. The disasters befalling the Last Supper are worthy of a lecture in and of itself. But to, just to give you some idea, and it points to the very first mistake of uh, Dan Brown, is that the painting is not a fresco. This is a mixed media. It's a combination of temper and mastic and pitch. And the reason that's significant is twofold. Firstly, Leonardo never liked the technique of fresco painting, which required rapidity and speed to apply pigment to the wall surface before it dried. He preferred a much more slow and deliberate method. In fact, his uh, patient complained that he never finished anything in time. He worked much too slowly. So he invented a whole new process to paint on the wall. And as a result, it was chemically unstable. The pigments never adhered to the surface. And thus, by the time it was finished, within a few years, pigments began to run. By the middle of the 16th century, certainly by 1540, the Last Supper was already just a ghost of its original form. 
and the biographer artist Vasari describes how little there was to see. Make things even worse, in the year 1500, the king of France, Francis I, visited Milan, loved the Last Supper and said, let's take the wall home with us to Paris. Fortunately, it proved to be too difficult and the Last Supper remained. Then during the Napoleonic Wars, Napoleon used the dining room of these monks where the Last Supper was for a stable. And the troops of Napoleon used to fire their weapons at the Last Supper, throw dung and clay at it. And if that wasn't bad enough, in the 18th century, uh, we also find the beginnings of some of the most horrendous restoration in which Leonardo's paints and ideas become more and more erased. And even later than that, in order to protect what was left, a large cloth was placed over the Last Supper. The unfortunate thing about that is that the wall was moist and what developed was a green fungus which covered everything. So this is a uh, problem which has occurred over many, many years. The destruction slow, sometimes deliberate, of one of the greatest masterpieces. And now the, all, the Last Supper has been the product of the recent and hopefully last restoration, which was completed in 1998. So we're looking at a work that has lots and lots of other hands to it, and that's important to realize so that we can recognize what Dan Brown says is not normally based on Leonardo's ideas, but on a lot of these restoration and renovations over several centuries of time. Now, if we take a look at the Last Supper, those of you who haven't been uh, in Milan may not realize this is an enormous painting. It covers the entire end wall of this dining room. It is 30 feet across, it is 15 feet high. And the image of Christ seated at the table is eight feet plus. So this is a very large fresco. I'm sorry, a very large mixed media. What we see before us also has to be understood in terms of its function. In front of this mixed media, in front of the Last Supper, quite a suitable subject for a dining room, there would have been the monk's table set perpendicular to the painted table before them. So that, in a sense, symbolically, with the painted Last Supper at one end and the table of the monks uh, perpendicular to it, it would be like a Latin cross to remind us of Christ's sacrifice upon the cross for the redemption of humankind. Equally important is that facing this painting of Leonardo on the opposite wall was a painting that was completed in 1494 by the Milanese artist Montefano in which we see the subject of the crucifixion with the good thief on Christ's right and the bad thief on Christ's left. The reason this is important is that Leonardo makes reference to it in his own Last Supper as we'll see when we begin to examine it. Now, as we take a look at the Last Supper itself, it is interesting to at least relate what the Last Supper is. This is the gathering of Jesus and his disciples to celebrate the Jewish feast of Passover. And at this gathering, Christ blesses the bread and blesses the wine. He consecrates the bread and wine and as such institutes the first Mass. Christ is the first priest, this is the first mass, and at the same time, it is our union with divinity. It is our union with Jesus. And it's ironic that Christ himself is the most notable celebrant of this mass, and at the same time, its most notable victim. Now, as we take a look at the Last Supper, again, it is interesting to understand it in the context of the story. The story of the Last Supper is described in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and in uh, Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 11, verse 23 to 26. And it's Paul's letter to the Corinthian, which we read Christ's words, do this in remembrance of me, which serves as the basis for the Catholic liturgy. And we should remember that the Last Supper, completed in 1498, precedes the Protestant Reformation, precedes Luther's nailing of his 95 statements on October 31st, 1570. So we're looking at a Catholic painting within the context of the Catholic faith. Now, as we look at the representation, we have to know something about Leonardo's character. Leonardo, if anything, had a passion for the exact. And this passion for the exact led Leonardo to mathematics, to mechanics and logic. But he also had an insatiable need to know. 
And this need to know of Leonardo led him toward experiment and observation. So what would Leonardo do if given the commission to paint a Last Supper? Well, surely he would have read all of the Gospel accounts. The Gospel accounts are not the same in their description of the event. Additionally, not only would he have read the accounts of the Last Supper, of the, uh, the institution of the Eucharist, but he also would have read the entire Gospel, not simply a passage. And in addition to that, we have to recall for whom the Last Supper was painted. It was painted for the Dominicans, and certainly the Dominicans who were the leading intellectuals of the medieval and Renaissance period certainly would have advised Leonardo also in various interpretations of the themes. Now the Dominicans themselves are important not only for uh, understanding Leonardo's commission, but also in terms of what they sought, what they promoted. They believed in proselytizing, so they sought to convert others, and they believed in the suppression of heresy. That is to say, that heresy was considered a crime against God, and a heretic would certainly be burnt at the stake. All the major inquisitors of the medieval and Renaissance period were primarily Dominicans. So you can imagine for a moment how tall Leonardo would be after being stretched on the rack for two or three months if he in fact introduced the greatest heresy of all, that instead of John the Evangelist, it's Mary Magdalene, and this is the wife of Jesus. It would be absolutely impossible for the Dominicans to accept that. And the Dominicans looked at their art carefully. They believed in the idea of Gregory the Great, who died in 601, that art is the Bible to the illiterate. So they would have looked at this painting very, very cautiously. And they would have seen it every single day from start till completion for the years that follow. So the idea that this would contain heresies at all is rather far-fetched. Now you might wonder, what would the typical Dominican look like? Well, let me show you the leading Dominican of Florence, who in 1495, when Leonardo was doing the Last Supper, was in fact the, uh, the ruler, in a sense, of the city of Florence. This is the Dominican monk Savonarola. And no matter what else you can say about him, in looking at this portrait, I think it's safe to assert, he didn't have a sense of humor. So <laughs> Savonarola certainly preached the bonfire of the vanities and his fiery fulmination scared the devil out of people. The meteoric ascent of Savonarola to power, however, was met by an even more fiery demise, because he himself was burnt at the stake as a heretic by his own Dominicans. So you didn't fool around with the Dominicans, so we should keep that in mind. And Leonardo was not a hero. He wasn't heroic in any sense of the word. He certainly would not have tried to challenge uh, anyone, whether it was Michelangelo, as uh, Michelangelo once threatened to knock him out, uh, or the Dominicans who probably would have had him stretched or burnt at the stake. So we have to keep that in mind in looking at the representations. Now the Last Supper deals with the most crucial element of Roman Catholic theology. It deals with the principle of transubstantiation, the Catholic belief that wafer and wine change substance, transubstantiate into the body and blood of Christ. Now there's much theological debate from the early Christian into, of course, the time of Leonardo in regard to when the change actually occurs. In the year 1215 at the Fourth Lateran Council, it's decided that the change takes place at consecration. And nearly 50 years later, in 1264, Urban IV initiates the Feast of Corpus Christi, the feast that the real presence of Christ is in the wine and the wafer. So there are lots of interpretations and analyses concerning the supper itself, theologically as well as visually. Now, in terms of last suppers, as we take a look at Leonardo's work, I think we'll begin to see, and we'll let's point it out here, that there are a number of inaccuracies as we just investigate the painting itself in regard to what Dan Brown asserts. Dan Brown asserts that there is a space between what he calls uh, Mary Magdalene, whom I call John the Evangelist and Jesus, and that V-shaped space is the symbol for women. It is also an M that he finds there, a symbol of Mary Magdalene. He says that there is a disembodied hand with a knife at the table, no body to be seen. If it is so, if it is a disembodied hand, then it must belong to the most vertically challenged individual in the world, doesn't even come up to tabletop. 
And then, in addition to that, he asserts that Peter is leaning forward, ready to slice the throat of Mary Magdalene. Well, as we look at this, let's take an examination of those elements by looking at the traditions of Last Suppers and then seeing what is unique about Leonardo and what contribution it makes. There are only three kinds of Last Suppers. There is the Last Supper that stresses consecration. There's the Last Supper that shows acceptance of the wine and wafer. And there is the third representation, which is the betrayal. What we're looking at here is a 15th century Flemish painting by Dirk Bouts, a large altarpiece, twice life size, the side panels uh, with stories from the Old Testament, prefigurations to the Last Supper, Abraham and Melchizedek, the Jewish Passover, the gathering of manna, and Elijah and the angel. And then in the central panel, we see the subject of the Last Supper. Now, if you take a look at the representation here, one of the first things that should strike you is that it's almost impossible to identify which of these disciples is Judas. And in fact, art historians have argued over many decades as to which of these individuals may be the betrayer. The reason for the difficulty is that Dirk Bouts isn't trying to stress the betrayal. And each gospel account stresses a different element in the description of the Last Supper. If we take a look here, it is a typical northern painting. It is full of all sorts of discrete symbols, including, for example, the chandelier without a single candle. No light is necessary in the presence of Christ. For as St. Dominic himself says, Christ is the light of the world. He shout shines all natural light. The light itself, the visible manifestation of the divine. And as we take a look at the number of figures, we notice something curious. Not only do we have Christ and the 12 disciples, but there's four other individuals present, two looking in from presumably a kitchen, one behind the figure of Peter, and another off to the right wearing a red turban. These four individuals, not described in the Gospels, are the individuals who commission the artist to do the painting. And thus, ego is large, as you can see from the air. They want to be included in the religious subject. Extraordinary. The scene takes place in the daytime. The gospel accounts say the Last Supper is at evening. And through the windows, we do not see Jerusalem. We see the city in which this altarpiece was to be placed, the city of Louvain, and thus elevates that city to a place where miracles occur. The other items here, once again, typically northern, and none of this appears in Leonardo's work. An open door, barely to be seen what's inside on your far right, a reference to the Annunciation. Outside that back window, an enclosed garden, symbolizing the Immaculate Conception. We see further, uh, above the tympanum in the doorway, the image of Moses with the Ken Kebed, it's the bringing of law. So there's a whole series of elements here that are included in the painting that don't appear in the gospel descriptions. So it's not impossible to have more individuals. What is absolutely impossible is to have a Last Supper with, no, with any single disciple missing. By definition, you must have all 12 disciples present, even though you may add a variety of elements, as we will see. Now, as you take a look at the detail before us, a wonderful representation of Christ. Notice the individual immediate to Christ's left. The individual looking youthful, beardless, and with red hair. It's St. John the Evangelist. It's not Mary Magdalene. This is the characteristic way of showing John. He is always seen, with some exceptions, as the youthful. He's the youngest of the disciples, and thus clean, uh, clearly distinguishable at representations of the Last Supper. If we look further, notice the plate in front of Christ. It is empty. That's because the Paschal Lamb has not been sacrificed, so the plate is left uh, without uh, the lamb on it. And if you look at the gesture of Christ, notice something curious about what he's doing. Although the accounts in uh, the Gospels say that Christ blessed first the bread and then the wine, that he's done them sequentially, here the stress is on blessing both the wine and the wafer together. They're done concurrently. So this is clearly a representation of the consecration of the sacrament. And to make it absolutely crystal clear, we show you a painting in which we draw some diagonals and the exact center of that work of art is the uh, hand of Jesus blessing the wine and the wafer. So all of these things appear in a variety of sources.
If we look at the second representation of Last Suppers, here we see again, very difficult to establish who the betrayer is unless you understand in the representation before us that Judas is physically separated from the, left, uh, from the rest. He is on your far right, uh, as you can see, looking at the back of Christ, not accidental that the artist put him behind Jesus, the suggestion of betrayal, of stabbing Christ in the back, thus represented in that manner. And here we see Christ about to administer the host to his his disciples. And once again, notice who was holding the chalice. The individual, once again youthful, the youngest among all those disciples present, it is clearly Saint John the Evangelist. Now with that in mind, let me show you the Italian tradition so we bring it right back to Leonardo. In Italy, the tradition of Last Suppers is to include the subject in a representation of other stories. What we see here is a detail one of the stories of Christ's life, of the Last Supper, in the Arena Chapel in Padua by Giotto, one of the greatest of medieval painters. If we take a look at the Last Supper of Giotto, it shows us another tradition to consider. The mixing of stories so that an artist can take events from one gospel or count or another and combine them into one scene. Here, the fact that Christ and Judas reach for the bread that is to be placed and dipped into that uh, bowl comes from the Gospel of Matthew and Mark. The figure of John falling upon the bosom of Jesus comes directly from uh, the Gospel of John. So this is not something that is unusual in visual traditions. If we look at the detail, one of the things that would strike you would be that all the disciples seem to have black halos and stand out prominently from Jesus with his gold halo. Well, if you looked at this through the eyes, perhaps, of Dan Brown, you might conclude that the artist was anti-disciples and that he showed even Judas with a halo. But, of course, the explanation is much simpler. With the representation of Christ, more expensive pigments were used. His halo was normally depicted with gold leaf. The halos, which were painted yellow, gold, of the disciples, was painted with silver oxide, and over the centuries, the silver tarnished and turned those halos black. And what appears in the figure in the foreground in the lower left with that black at first glance halo, that's the figure of Judas, he's the only figure without a halo, that blackness is just dirt and grime that hasn't yet been cleaned from the fresco. So there's easy ways to be deluded in what you see. You have to understand a little bit about tradition and hopefully a little bit about uh, the artist and the commission. Now with that in mind, let me show you the traditions that Leonardo definitely would have seen and would have tried to outdo, to make something different than all of his predecessors. In Italy, in 15th century Florence, in the 1450s and 60s, we see, for example, a Last Supper. In Italy particularly, the Last Supper was normally seen in the context of Christ's passion, such as we see here with this enormous wall fresco in the church of Santa Apollonia. The frescoes by Del Castagno, one of the great artists of the mid-15th century. In the upper portion of the fresco, we have the resurrection, the crucifixion, and the entombment. And below, we see the subject of the Last Supper. And it should strike anyone that here, Judas is easily uh, recognized. Yes, he's physically separated from the rest. The room itself is completely divorced from the character of Christ, however. It's a rich room filled with pagan elements. For example, the sphinxes we see at the top of the benches on the left and right. Sphinxes, incidentally, are the guardians of the mysteries of faith. So they're here suggesting the mystery of the celebration of the Eucharist. And here, surprisingly again, the figure of uh, Judas is even higher than the figure of Christ, who's directly opposite him. Here the suggestion is the idea of evil looming, and it looms large in the representation before us. Now with that in mind, as I said, taking us slowly back to the Last Supper of Leonardo, let me show you some other things, and again to put it in the context of what Leonardo achieves. Here we see a wall fresco, it's in the Sistine Chapel of the Vatican. Uh, it deals with the Last Supper and through the windows we see three events that follow the Last Supper. The agony in the garden, uh, where we see Christ asking his father for strength. Uh, we see in the center the betrayal by Judas with a kiss. And on the far right we see the representation of the crucifixion with the good and bad thief. 
Now, if we take a look at the representation, once again, the typical Italian depiction of this scene is to physically isolate Judas. This is the characteristic 15th century representation. We notice the donors, once again, the people with money having to wander into the scene and are seen uh, framing the uh, painting on the left and right. We see some vessels in the foreground, a reference to Christ washed the feet of his disciples before the Last Supper. And then we see a dog and cat fighting. This is a traditional symbol. It's odd to have animals suddenly appear in the Last Supper. It's a traditional symbol of good versus evil. And over here, we see a cute little dog on his hind legs, uh, which at first glance seems to be nothing more than an incidental bit of humor. But as you'll see, nothing is introduced into religious art by accident. There's all part of a design or a tradition. Now, although almost impossible to see, sitting on the shoulder of Judas is Satan himself, whispering in his ear. And it refers to that moment described in the Gospel of John, that when Judas, so unworthy, takes that sacrament, takes that bread, the devil entered into him. So there's a whole range of representations of Last Suppers. Now this idea of the devil entering you is marvelously depicted here in a Last Supper which dates after Leonardo. Here we see the betrayal has been announced, people react. We see others who are uh, celebrating the Mass by partaking the bread and the wine. Here we see Judas with red hair and red beard holding that 30 pieces of coin in that bag. And notice the figure on the far right with those lovely size 22 chicken feet that you can see with these wonderful talons, his clawed hands and that wonderful mask of death. That Satan himself ready to embrace Judas, ready to enter into him. So all of these are out. Now a moment ago I mentioned the dog is not introduced by accident. And you can see that in a painting of the 17th century, which is primarily a copy after Leonardo's Last Supper, with certain additions. Instead of the windows in the background, we have curtains pulled aside, the symbol of the uh, unveiling of a prophecy. But notice the dog directly below the figure of Judas. The dog in a Last Supper refers to a passage in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, verse 6, in which we read the following. Do not give that which is holy to a dog, and cast not pearl before swine. In other words, you don't give the sacrament to those people unworthy of it. And this is why dogs appear in representations of Last Supper. Now with all that in mind, let's return with our examination of the Last Supper. As I said, Leonardo's work should strike you immediately, if for no other purpose than its absolute simplicity. There are no disguised symbols here. There's no endless number of objects. There's no dogs. In fact, it is a very plain representation that illustrates Leonardo's entire philosophy of life. It is the idea of one wall, one space, one story. And what Leonardo has done, unlike all of his predecessors, is to ask himself a basic question. He asks himself this, what would the words of Christ be like what would they and how would they affect the disciples? When Christ says, verily, verily, one of these shall betray me, Leonardo takes those words and applies it to all these individuals who then respond according to their individual personalities. Personalities that Leonardo believes exist from his understanding of the Gospels, from his researches, from his conversations with the Dominicans. So here, Judas is not physically isolated, but instead he becomes psychologically uh, isolated. This is the most extraordinary painting in terms of understanding human uh, psychology. Now, if we take a look at the representation, as I said, the uh, author Dan Brown asserts all sorts of extraordinary things. And as we take a look at this, let's examine firstly the idea of the so-called V, the space between John the Evangelist, i.e. Mary Magdalene, and Jesus, and the alleged M that appears behind them. I could make a much more reasonable case that that figure that uh, is alleged to be Mary Magdalene is really the Virgin Mary. I could argue that the V and the M that allegedly is there, and I don't see them incidentally, is the symbol of the Virgin Mary, V for Virgin, M for Mary. And I could go further and suggest that she's falling back as she already sees the horrible death of her son upon the cross. 
But that would be, unfortunately, <laughs> equally erroneous, even more so, because an art historian shouldn't make that. So when we take a look at this, let's first examine some of the ideas. And we can see them better when we take a look at the weaving done in the early uh, 1500s, when the fresco was reasonably easy to read. If we take a look at the representation, let's see in the engraving, which in fact is the engraving that allows us to identify all of the disciples. This engraving of about 1530 shows the Last Supper with certain changes, the background, the sacrifice of Isaac by Abraham, the agony in the garden, but all of the names of the disciples are clearly represented below. And if you now take a look at the depiction before us, you can see, for example, that the figure of the hand is really the hand and arm of none other than St. Peter. The knife that he holds is a reference to an event that takes place the next day when Christ is seized after he is betrayed by Judas. Peter takes a knife and slices off the ear of one of those trying to take Christ. So this is a relatively straightforward reference. Additionally, as we take a look, we should realize what the Gospel of John says. Because clearly, Leonardo's representation hints, suggests, and re-emphasizes the words of John. In the Gospel of John, after Christ announces, one of you shall betray me, Peter leans forward to John. It's exactly what he's doing there. And he says, John, ask him who the heck he's referring to. So John, after hearing Peter ask him to find out, then goes to Jesus and says, who it is that you're referring to? And Christ replies, it's the person to whom I give this bread. So Christ, John, Peter, and Judas occupy a very important relationship. Christ, Peter, John, and Judas are the only ones who actually know the betrayer. Additionally, as we take a look at Peter, he's not trying to slice the throat of John the evangelist with his other hand. He's simply gesturing to John to ask Jesus that question. Now, if you look further at the representation, it's also suggested by Dan Brown that for a particular reason, Leonardo didn't paint the feet of Christ while painting the feet of his disciples. This equally is totally erroneous. Because what happened in the Last Supper was at some point in the 16th century, it was decided that a door should be placed in the uh, dining room, and they cut a door into that space and they eliminated the feet of Christ. So that's what you see today, no feet of Christ, but a nice door which has hence been sealed. So with that in mind, let's take a look at the details of the Last Supper. And once again, trying to understand it in the context of what Leonardo achieves. Leonardo, as I said, is trying to understand individual personality, individuals under stress, how they react to the words of Christ. And if you look at the disciples on Christ's immediate left and on his immediate right, we can identify them relatively easily. The individual with his finger raised high is the doubting Thomas who challenges Christ with that gesture to prove that it is he who will betray him. Well, if you read the Gospel of John, you'll come across after the Last Supper, after Christ says that uh, he is going to take a path the disciples cannot immediately follow. And Thomas says, well, show us the way. And Christ says, if you've seen me, you've seen the way, the truth, and life. Thomas represents reason. Everything must be proved to him. The other figure with his hands across his head, leaning forward, asking or pleading with Christ, could it possibly be me, Lord, who will betray you, is the figure of Philip. It's Philip who asks Christ, show me the Father. And Christ replies, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In other words, you have to have faith. You have to have faith in Christ. You have to have faith in your belief. So Philip, who's the second largest figure in the uh, painting, Christ being the first, represents the idea of faith and connecting faith with reason. The two principal elements of Christianity and Judaism is the figure of James the Greater, the older brother of John, whose arms outstretched express complete and total surprise and shock of Christ's words. Now, if you look at Christ's gestures for just a moment, we notice also that his right hand is extended palm downward, his left hand is extended palm upward. Now, it is not the blessing of bread or wine that those gestures suggest. Instead, they refer to the good and bad thief on the opposite wall. 
the good thief on Christ's right in the crucifixion corresponds to the left hand of Jesus, and hence palm upward suggests salvation. The right hand of Christ's palm downward refers to the bad thief on Christ's left and indicates damnation. So every gesture is reasonably clear and understood. Now if we look at the figure of Christ himself, he is a perfect triangle. His space is equal to the space of all each other triad of figures. And the triangle clearly is a symbol of the Trinity. And Christ's role is the second member of that uh, three. Now with that in mind, as I said, looking at these things and seeing uh, what is actually before us, we should ask ourselves, John the Evangelist. Who is John the Evangelist? John, firstly, is the younger brother of James the Greater. He is a disciple. He is an apostle. He is an evangelist. And he is a mystic. He is the author of the book of Revelations. He's known as the apostle of charity. And he wrote his gospel is clearly the gospel of love. He's the only disciple that didn't desert Christ when Christ was upon the cross. And it's this disciple that Christ most loved. And it's this disciple, John, that Christ says, take care of my mother, watch out for my mother. And it's in John's home that the Virgin Mary resides after the death of Christ upon the cross. Now, if you take a look at this representation, not by Leonardo, but just to show you, if you think Leonardo's figure looks effeminate, notice this individual here with these beautiful little pursed lips, looks like Betty Boop of the 1930s. And you have these wonderful ringlets of curl as gold as corn and nice rouged cheeks. But this is John the Evangelist. And the reason, and this sounds sexist, but it wouldn't have been in the Renaissance and medieval period, the traits you associate with John, gentility, kindness, love, sweetness, all of these things were considered to be more feminine traits than masculine. So traditionally, John is almost always represented as being youthful. Now, if we look further at the depiction, incidentally, what appears to be a large block rooster, not a very good painting, is actually supposed to be an eagle, which is one of the attributes of John. And the eagle is uh, resting upon the book of John, the Gospel of John. Now, it also is asserted by Dan Brown that Leonardo knew how to make figures so mistaken gender. But in Take a look at Leonardo's work. He does lots of figures that are relatively difficult to determine whether they are male or female, as we see here in this depiction of none other than John the Baptist. It's hard to imagine this last of the Old Testament prophets looking quite as, not sissified, but certainly quite as uh, non-threatening as the description of John uh, surely shows us. So these are all things that, as I said, clearly are mistakes by the part of Dan Brown. Now returning to the full view, we look at yet another by the author, and that is the, uh, <coughs> pardon me, the, uh, the lunettes that appear above the Last Supper. Now this isn't some sort of mystic form, no runic writing. These are the coats of arms of Lodovico Sforza and his wife Beatrice uh, Desti. And in fact, you can even make out some of the lettering suggesting that. So there's no hidden code here at all. What we see instead is an extraordinary representation of Leonardo. As I said, to depict a scene that no one else has uh, depicted before, something that breaks with tradition. And if we look at the representation of the Last Supper, we notice that in the sense of all this chaos, there's order. Order imposed by the grouping of these four groups of three disciples each. There is order in the serenity of Christ, and there is order in the very presentation of this extraordinary moment. Now, I mentioned that Leonardo's work before us has this space between John and Jesus, and it's asserted by Brown that it represents the female principle. But in fact, the Last Supper is a reconciliation of opposites. The serenity of Christ before us, suggesting he is already into the next world with the noise, the clamor, and chaos of the disciples. There's love versus hate. There is the communion of love, the wafer on wine suggested by Christ, and there is the betrayal by Jesus. There's good and evil. There's every single opposite that you can imagine. 
or to put it slightly differently, it's the entire representation of the human condition. And if we look at the background, we see three windows. Christ occupies the second, the number associated with Jesus. He's the second in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And by placing Christ directly in the center of the composition, Christ becomes the vanishing point for that painting. In other words, Christ becomes the center of light, he becomes the center of space, and he's the center of life. So with that, I thank you for allowing me my 25 minutes of presentation. And if you want to take art history, St. Mary's University College has my course. It's relatively good. And <laughs> we'll get into even more information. Thank you. <laughs> Did I stay with my 25 minutes? Remember to buy David Burchard's book rather than the Da Vinci Code. Um, I think the Pope didn't want me to prepare this talk because uh, I um, was planning on doing it in the last two weeks and I became involved in various forum uh, dealing with his uh, statements to the uh, Ontario bishops about the uh, spiritual tenor of Canada, which he said is uh, it's quite uh, unchristian and uh, rather decadent, and um, also in his most recent statement about uh, Islam that was part of his talk at the University of Regensburg on September the 12th, where he quoted uh, Manuel II uh, Paleologos in this very unfortunate description of uh, Islam and uh, the prophet, peace be upon him. So as a result, I don't have a prepared talk what I do have, though, is you. And what I would like you to do is to, right now, consider what do you think of the Vatican? Because uh, our previous two speakers have given us excellent reflections on antiquity. Uh, Dr. Moore has uh, given us this uh, wonderful uh, description of the various presentations of Jesus and Mary Magdalene in uh, antiquity, both within the canonical uh, Gospels and also outside. Uh, Dr. Burchard has given us an excellent, magnificent presentation on uh, Leonardo da Vinci's work and set the Last Supper within its context. Now what I am going to try to do is invite you to think about the contemporary aspects of Dan Brown's work in uh, the book which have to do with the Vatican and Opus Dei. Now, I'm sure you know that Lord Acton uh, said that absolute power corrupts absolutely. Power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. I hope you also realize that the person he was speaking about was Pope Pius IX, the Pope who ha was responsible for bringing forth the uh, uh, doctrinal statement on infallibility. That was in 1870. I hope you realize that the papacy and the centralization of the papacy is uh, something that has taken place only in the last 130 to 140 years. Prior to this time, the papacy and uh, the decrees of the Pope took an awful long time to reach the rest of the world, although, of course, we have to recognize that the papacy became the heir of the Roman Empire and the imperial system. But the point that I want to make is that at least some attraction that, uh, to Dan Brown's work is because of people being um, distressed, I'll try to use a David Burchard word, uh, distressed, disappointed uh, in the papacy and uh, suspicious of the papacy today. Uh, because of its uh, movement towards centralization and in some ways, for at least a certain constituency within the Roman Catholic Church, a turning away from uh, the, uh, so to speak, revolutionary developments at the Second Vatican Council, which took place between 1964, or 1962 and uh, 1965. Now what I would like to do as you're reflecting on what you think of the papacy and how that contributed to your desire to read Dan Brown's book, uh, 
and um, is first of all just begin by saying what the film says about Opus Dei is absolutely fictional, uh, or in what the book says. It, it's absolutely contrived, it is ridiculous, it is impossible. Uh, for instance, Opus Dei does not ha is not a religious order in the traditional sense of the term. It wouldn't have a figure like this uh, man, who unfortunate man who is dressed in white and uh, who does an assassination and uh, things like that. However, let's uh, step back from this and at least uh, try to think of what motivates people to read the book, given that Dan Brown has got it all wrong. I add my comments on the contemporary scene uh, to what Anne and David have said about antiquity. Dan Brown doesn't know very much about the Vatican, nor about Opus Dei. But I think his readers know more than he does, and that's why they're interested in his book, because they uh, associate uh, some things that uh, are going on at the Vatican, at least as the news media presents them, with, uh, let me use the three words, power, secrecy, and control. Now see if, as you think of the Vatican, you think of power and control with uh, elements of secrecy. I think many people, when they hear, for instance, of the Pope's statement about uh, Islam, they wonder, well, where did this come from? Who would have made this speech? And how connected is the Pope to this world? He must live in a different world. He must live in this world of only men, celibate men, we hope, and that uh, with these men, that they come up with these ideas that are inappropriate for modernity. Now, the other thing that seems to uh, have interested Dan Brown is Opus Dei. Why does he pick on Opus Dei? Well, I don't know. Given the idea that he doesn't know much about Opus Dei, but Opus Dei is a very remarkable uh, lay association, very distinctive, unique to the 20th century. What Opus Dei, uh, we, I'm sure you can look it up on the internet, just Google in Opus Dei, you'll get lots of information. It was started in 1928 by a priest named Jose Maria uh, Escriva. He uh, added in there a title uh, no, uh, of nobility from Spain. He started this in 1928. Opus Dei is the Latin word, of course, for the work of God. And you want to locate uh, Escriva's uh, initiating the um, movement of Opus Dei with concerns about the rising of communism, which is a very great concern uh, around this time for the Roman Catholic Church. And of course, in Italy, the rising of fascism, and uh, certainly in Spain, the uh, turbulence that is going to lead to the Spanish Civil War. And of course what you know about the Spanish Civil War is that it is a war between, let me put it very simplistically, oversimplistically, between Catholics and Communists. And Catholicism in the war is identified with the side of Francisco Franco. Now in 1936, uh, Escriva opens uh, Opus Dei, this work of God, to women as well as to men. What does he have in mind? Well, what he has in mind is a lay association, an association of lay people. In Roman Catholicism, there is a great distinction between lay people and the clergy. In terms of sacramental theology, as uh, David was speaking about it, uh, many people don't realize that in sacramental theology, the emphasis is on uh, transformation, so that one who is ordained becomes ontologically different by the fact of ordination, and therefore distinct from lay people. There's a very strong distinction between lay people and clergy. What Escriva wanted to do was to start a movement of lay people. Why? Because he wanted to address the problems that he saw rising up because of the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. That's his concern. If you have a chance to read about these issues of Eugenio Pacelli being the uh, envoy of the Vatican to Germany at this time when Escriva is uh, starting his work and then Pacelli moves to be Secretary of State at the Vatican. Uh, 
what you realize is that Pacelli is far more afraid of communism than Nazism. Why is he afraid of it? Because he sees communism being much more godless. Now, and I don't want to prejudice everything against uh, Eugenio Pacelli, who becomes Pope Pius XII. I just want you to get a sense of the tensions. And what Escriva is trying to do is develop a lay association that would infiltrate the society to turn the tide away from this godless Marxism, that is, uh, uh, and Leninism, that now has taken hold of uh, Russia and is on the march through Europe. So, Escriva develops this uh, uh, group of the way, and what they are are lay people, primarily lay people, who emphasize the importance of achieving sanctity within the context of the world at large in order to transform that world for the better. They use means of very traditional piety, uh, and I don't mean that in a, in a paternalistic sense uh, or patronizing sense. What they emphasize is personal confession of sins to their priest. They emphasize gathering together for prayer. And then they emphasize working within the uh, uh, context of, of labor that they have in order to bring about good and beneficial results with the people they are with. Now, in 1939, Escriva writes a book called The Way, which is exactly what uh, uh, the Acts of the Apostles calls Christianity. For instance, in Acts chapter 9, verse 1, Paul persecutes the way. Of course, for Escriva, it's the way to sanctify the world. Now, as we are now in the Second World War, uh, his work is very, very beneficial, but also because Franco has won the Spanish Civil War. So, some people say, now this is where you can do your investigations, some people say that the effect of uh, Escriva's work and sustaining, supporting uh, Franco's regime was that they became very uh, influential in the government of Francisco Franco that extended right into the 1970s. And that's why Opus Dei became equate, uh, associated with fascism in the popular mind. Now the question that you can always ask is, is this a fair assessment or not? Uh, and I have my own ideas about that, but uh, I would like to hear yours at some time. Um, what I want you to then think about is what happens in the Second Vatican Council. The Second Vatican Council, there is a series of documents, but one of, the, one of the focuses in the Second Vatican Council is on the uh, empowerment, if you want. That's a very poor word. It's on the revitalization of people by virtue of their baptism to be able to transform the world and to carry the gospel throughout the world. In other words, According to Vatican II, which, by the way, was to conclude the First Vatican Council, which declared the Pope to be infallible, it had to be stopped because the forces of Victor Emmanuel II were at the gates of Rome, and it all got disbanded. When Pope John XXIII called the Second Vatican Council, he said, we've got to allow the Holy Spirit into the Church, and some people said, well, this is a continuation of Vatican I. Of course, as it continued, it really was a transformation of Vatican I. But if you read the documents of Vatican II, it's like having two parties opposed to one another writing the documents, so you read one line and say, oh, this is going to cha change everything, and the next line said, oh, it didn't change anything. Oh, this is going to change lots. No, well, we're still back where we were. That's part of the documents. Now, when we get to the Second Vatican Council with the empowerment of the laity, it is declericalizing the church and decentralizing it. Along with the empowerment of the laity, there is the validation that the local bishop within his diocese is the ultimate authority for the local, uh, the local populace. In this case, southern Alberta. Everything doesn't have to be referred to the papacy in Rome. All of this is great, 
When we uh, then see that many uh, people leave religious life and leave the priesthood, there gets to be a great fear within the Vatican circles that maybe everything is falling apart. What happens then when Pope John Paul II becomes uh, the Pope? He says the ideal for this church to be able to hold together in, uh, in view of all that has taken place in the 1960s is Opus Dei. Now that sounds like a very strong statement. But where that comes from is that in 1982, Pope John Paul II makes Opus Dei a personal prelature. And that is unprecedented. What a personal prelature is, is this. That all members of Opus Dei are answerable only to their bishop, and their bishop is in Rome, very close to the Vatican. At the same time, Pope John Paul II is reducing the authority of the Jesuits. Very shortly after he becomes Pope, he uh, has people go to Pedro Rupe, who is the uh, general of the Jesuits, and in inform him, and uh, this is in archives, I have one heard on very good authority from Jesuits, they inform him that he's no longer the uh, superior general of the Jesuits. And someone else has been appoint appointed by the Pope. Now that is unheard of in the history of the Jesuits for whatever, 400 and some years. They always appoint their own general. So do you see Opus Dei moves up, the Jesuits move down. After this, Opus Dei, of course, has its own um, uh, faculty of theology in Rome that John Paul uh, designates as a pontifical faculty. In other words, it is of the same stature as the Gregorian University, uh, the Faculty of Theology of the Jesuits in Rome. Uh, following, uh, I'm sorry, by now, uh, uh, Father Escriva has died in the 1970s. What takes place after that is very interesting. Uh, Father Escriva is canonized only some maybe 16 years after he dies. Nobody else is canonized uh, that quickly, or, or sorry, beatified, a step towards canonization. This is the topic, the subject matter, of a book called Making Saints by Kenneth Woodward, who was a, a religion editor for Newsweek magazine. You can read the book. It's a very interesting story. There is a, a book also called uh, Crossing the Threshold, A Life in Opus Dei by a woman named Carmen Maria del Tapia. If you want an interesting book to read, it is fascinating. She was with Opus Dei, and she was one of the leaders in Opus Dei in Venezuela uh, for 20 years. She knew Escriva personally. The reason that she wrote this book is because she had sent documentation to Rome prior to the beatification of Escriva and said, I don't think the man is a saint. After all, I lived in the same house with him for quite a while. And the reason that she wrote the book was nobody at the Vatican would read her papers. So she said, if you won't read them, then I will send them to the whole world. And that's, that's her book. There's another book that was written, very interesting book, around 1990. If you can get a hold of it, it is well worth reading. It is by a remarkable woman named Penny Lernou, L-E-R-N-O-U-X. It is called The People of God. Penny Lernou uh, died in midlife. Uh, of cancer. She was an expert on church affairs of the Roman Catholic Church in Latin America, especially in the period of liberation theology from, say, 1967, 1968, uh, up until 1990. Her story called The People of God is the story, as she puts it, of the end of liberation theology and the rise of Opus Dei. The replacement of liberation the, uh, Bishops who were sympathetic to liberation theology, that is empowering the masses to undertake land reform, to have greater equalization uh, among people within societies in Latin America, because the work of God, of course, is a work of liberation, according to the Exodus literature. And <clears throat> what happens, according to Penny Lernou, is that with John Paul II and his uh, being uh, very convinced that Marxism and Marxist analysis in terms of a class struggle 
is not a tall Christian, because he experienced this in Poland, that he said, what I must do, of course, is uh, convince people this is not the way we're going in Latin America. People who are quite cynical about this would say, uh, Pope John Paul II, in his sympathies with Ronald Reagan, uh, worked this out. John Paul II helped Ronald Reagan to work out the destruction of the, uh, the wall, the uh, Soviet regime, and in exchange, hopefully not in exchange, uh, Ronald Reagan asked John Paul II to stop the Comunitas de Baz, the liberation theology, particularly in Nicaragua, because it was harming American interests uh, and uh, investments in Latin America. The uh, way that some people make the take on this is that Opus Dei uh, became a source for bishops uh, uh, and the appointment of bishops in Latin America. It is true, for instance, I believe it's in Chile, there are now six Opus Dei bishops, whereas previously there were none. And in fact, Opus Dei refused to allow their priests to become bishops. I want you to realize, while I said Opus Dei is a lay group, it's the, it's the priests who really uh, are the spiritual guides of it all. Now, I'm going to stop here because the story can go on at length. What I want to say in conclusion is this, and I don't think Dan Brown knows any of this, by the way. I have, I have no thought that this man knows anything worthwhile about the Vatican or Opus Dei. I hope one of the things that you get from me is that uh, the members of Opus Dei are very remarkable people. Uh, I have friends who are members of Opus Dei. I am not, uh, uh, what can I say, I, I am not of that persuasion. But it is wrong to demonize everything about Opus Dei. If a person looks at it from the externals and says, well, they have a $43 million building uh, in Manhattan, what does that say about its attachment to power, etc.? Then you have to work beyond that as well. But the untold story in the present day Roman Catholicism is the link between the papacy and new religious movements that are so-called movements of lay people. In uh, June of 2006, uh, Pope Benedict XVI met with these hundreds of thousands of members of lay associations. And the reason that he likes them, they see these as the future of the church, is because they have young people involved and also because they're directly centralized back to the Vatican without the intercession of the regional bishops. What does all of this mean? Of course, it means that the leaders of these lay associations, Opus Dei being one of the foremost of them, others go by the name of the Neocatechumenal Movement, the uh, Communion and Liberation, Focolare, and there are all kinds of them. If you want to read about them, you can read a book called, by Gordon Urquhart that is called The Pope's Armada. It is quite a, quite a book uh, if, you, if you take a look at that. But what I think... A, a, um, Dan Brown has picked up on in the uh, Da Vinci Code is, of course, our sense that the Vatican is very powerful, that it's very secretive, and it has organizations that have infiltrated society. And Opus Dei very likely does have some of its members in governance in various parts of the world, because they do this very well and hopefully for benevolent purposes. And that's where this question of, uh, of conspiracy uh, that is saturating Dan Brown's book, I think, is, is just unfair and wrong. I'm going to stop there, but the uh, discussion about new religious movements is major. Let's go straight to your questions. I'll give you the mic so you, you can be heard. Any questions, comments? Oscar, I'd be surprised if you didn't have a question. <laughs> can you keep it short? Thanks. Yes, uh, I study world history also. I believe that uh, the UN, the World Bank, and the Vatican is the beast. But the Vatican themselves, I'm being honest with you, is a whore of the earth. It's, they control all the churches in the world. 
they manipulate the public. And my question is, what do you think to my question? Am I wrong or right? Do you, Oscar? I think you're wrong. I just think you're wrong. I think, I think you attribute an awful lot more power to the Vatican than it has. I, uh, and uh, I, uh, uh, I don't deny that there is, there is reason for your suspicions and that there is reason for your, uh, for your convictions. Uh, and uh, I, I don't deny that. And uh, so I welcome your perspective. I think it's somewhat radical, that's all. But welcome. Any other questions? Comments, yes. Um, do you mean on, on the Gnostic Gospels or in women in early Christianity or the history of Christianity? Uh, yeah. Fairly regular basis is rather, rather hard because um, you're going to have to get into academic magazines. What I can suggest is if you're looking at something on early Christianity, uh, a gentleman by the name of Valet, V-A-L-L-E-E, -E, uh, who is actually a Canadian scholar, wrote a book called The Shaping of Christianity, which deals with the early first centuries, and it's an easy read. Um, I can also suggest um, a book that is a, it's a little harder slog because she writes very um, intensely, but she's also a former speaker with the Chair of Christian Thought, and that's a book by Margaret Miles. Uh, Margaret Miles has a wonderful book on Christian history, and if you want to actually contact me at the university, I can get you the actual, uh, the actual name of the book is The Word Made Flesh. And what is also exciting about the book is she not only includes the text, but she's also begun to include art and music and liturgy to give us an understanding of what the people are like. Um, Gnostic Gospels, I would suggest reading the most recent book that came out to explain Gnosticism is Karen King, uh, who's, and her book is literally What is Gnosticism? And so that would be a good book uh, to gather. Um, the book on women's history, the difficulty at the moment for that one is it is in constant flux. Uh, Karen Torgensen wrote a book a while ago called When Women Were Priests which gives a fairly popular version. I don't know if it's still in print. Um, another good scholar is uh, Margaret MacDonald. Um, they've just done a book on the early house churches, um, A Woman's Place. And in that one, they talk about how women probably actually operated in early Christianity, and they have a whole, their perspective is using a lot of information from Greek and Roman studies. Um, very narrow in its time period, uh, but wonderful book at, in understanding how complex the issue is and how difficult it is for us to work through the sources because we're having to read through the lines all the time. Um, and I'm trying off the top of my head to think of other. Um, Anne, no, Amy Jill Levine has done a whole series of books called A Feminist Companion. And sh her and her group of uh, women scholars have literally taken every book of the New Testament and have a whole ream of articles many of them written in the popular vein because uh, the publisher was concerned about making it um, available to church people. And so there's books, uh, articles contained in that which would give you an understanding. Thank you. Um, my, I, I don't know if you know the quote by P.T. Barnum that no one ever lost money by uh, underestimating the intelligence of the average American. Um, but one of my goals for this talk tonight was to try to get some ideas for a, a book that will um, be translated into eight languages and uh, 60 million. And I haven't gotten enough really wild conspiracy theories, but 
I'm working on it. And um, I, I guess the question I have for you is that you're, you've all seen these sorts of discussions arise over time. How do, how do we realistically, I mean, academics, we think that we can talk to people and they'll listen, but how do we realistically communicate uh, against this onslaught of uh, ridiculous ideas and um, conspiracy theories that just, I mean, it just sounds beyond imagination. But uh, I just go back to my P.T. Barnum quote and say, I want to make money from it. But um, if I don't want to do that, but I want to, what is your experience of seeing how to address these kinds of uh, conspiracy problems? <laughs> well, no, I, I'm not, I'm not going to, I mean, I've heard these things from a child that uh, these kinds of uh, assertions about that the book of Revelation is talking about Va Vatican and, and, and so on. Um, I've heard that kind of stuff, and I, I'm sorry, I just, as, a, as a, a thinking evangelical, want to be able to engage in my community in a thoughtful way, and I want to know how to effectively do that. How do we, and, and what is your experience on that? How, what's the best way to do that? Well, I, I think what we're doing tonight is probably the best way. And uh, nothing takes the place of conversation. Uh, what we, we all need to, uh, I think we all need to follow, when we're talking about these serious issues that can be very divisive and can cause real prejudice, uh, what we need to uh, do is say, but I can talk to, in this case, Roman Catholics, or I could talk to members of Opus Dei if we can identify, if they'll identify themselves. And um, I can learn more, right? And the internet, by the way, is a very good source as long as we're looking for uh, websites and then uh, talking to one another. I don't have any secret, but to follow our gut instincts and to talk to people who are in the traditions. It's, it would be reciprocal. You know, one of the problems in Roman Catholicism, that uh, this is no news to anybody, is it's vulnerable to the charge of idolatry. I say this as a Roman Catholic, because it makes the church into God, or it makes the Pope into God. And any time it does so, we need the Protestant... Uh, and no, not just any time it does so. Always we need the Protestant uh, balance that says, no, we need Martin Luther always talking to the Roman Catholic Church. And that's, the, to me, the tragedy of the uh, Reformation that the Roman Catholic Church is responsible for, is for not allowing, let me be very clear, in any level of organization in the Roman Catholic Church, there is no forum for loyal dissent. There is no forum for lay people to have a vote to change the operation. And there is no forum for people to tell their story just the way their life experience has been. That is really effective. Therefore, uh, we are, as Roman Catholics, very vulnerable. That's why people like Dan Brown can make lots of money off of this secret society. But that's why the, in order for Christianity to become well, we have to recognize that we all need one another. And so hopefully this would be an opportunity for all Roman Catholics to be called out of secrecy and say, well, you know, what are you all about? And how can we learn from the other traditions so that these kind of improper uh, associations of power uh, are simply not taking place within the church. And I think there is a real need for that critique today. It's already 9.30. Uh, can I get the three of you to agree to take a cup of coffee and chat further about things? Feel free to chat further around the coffee table. Thanks for coming. And again, if you want to be on our mailing list, please sign the page. <laughs>